Hi, and welcome to the SDSU Studio Series. In the midst of what is happening in the world today, we've created a series of digital conversations with Broadway professionals, where we talk about the craft and the business of Broadway, and how we can pass along this legacy to the next generation of musical theater artists. The SDSU Studio Series is organized by the SDSU MFA Musical Theater Program, this program is only one of a handful of graduate degrees offered in the United States that offer the terminal degree in musical theater. And our graduates are acting, directing, choreographing, music directing, writing, and teaching in university positions worldwide. Our goal is to bring the professional world and the academic world together so that students of musical theater are prepared for today's job market. My name is Robert Muff. I worked as a professional conductor, music director, and orchestrator on Broadway for 22 years before moving to San Diego to become head of the MFA Musical Theater Program. My goal is that every person who wants to be a musical theater artist is able to access what is going on in the professional world, which led me to creating this series and which leads me to my guest, Tom Kitt. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Before we begin, I want to give some expectations of today's discussion. If you have questions, feel free to use the question and answer function built into Zoom. After my questions are completed, I will ask questions from your submissions. And hey, if you're from a university musical theater program, type the name of your school in the chat function. I would love to see who's represented. So let's begin. Tom Kitt is one of Broadway's leading composers. In addition to High Fidelity, Bring It On, and If Then, he and collaborator Brian Yorkey won the Pulitzer Prize for Next to Normal. Before the coronavirus, he had three New York productions of the works, Jagged Little Pill, which opened in December, and two other shows that were in rehearsal, Flying Over Sunset and The Visitor. So Tom, the university musical theater community is adapting to the corona outbreak by migrating classes online and providing content like this interview to students and educators worldwide. How are you coping? And how does something like this affect being a composer? Well, this is uh, certainly as, as difficult a situation as you could uh, ever have to deal with. Um, um, it's, um, sorry, I have a daughter and she just walked in. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is living at home with your family all the time. Um, Certainly what you, what you uh, mentioned um, has brought enormous challenges, the, the, the basic stoppage of all of your work and, uh, and certainly your livelihood because working in the theater, it's all about um, live performance. And if that goes away, um, then, then you're suddenly without work. Um, so uh, I think also there's the enormous, um, you know, there's the enormous challenges to your uh, mental state and to your ability to be productive and creative. Uh, I think when this all started, and I certainly had a number of conversations with my friends and, and fellow artists, um, there was a, a sense, well, maybe I'll, I'll use this time since I'm home, I'll use it to create, I'll use it to uh, work on this project that I've been always thinking about working on. Um, but creating art is really about a safe place and an inspired state of mind. And um, I think at first for me, especially being in New York City, um, it was really hard to draw inspiration and feel safe because you were watching. And as I look out the window now, as I'm speaking, you, you've seen um, a version of your home that you never thought you would encounter, something out of a movie. Um, and um, the fact also that we have to go through all this alone, that we are sheltering in place. We can't see our families, extended families. Um, you can't go out for drinks with a friend. Um, it's, uh, you can't go and just lose yourself in your, in, in, in your work or in the work of the artists that, um, that you get to, get to collaborate with. So um, I, I think that uh, there's a certain sense where the days kind of bleed into one another and you, in one aspect, gain a, a routine or at least um, you've just kind of lulled into what this is. Um, 
and I think the the real challenge is how do you as an artist break out of that and um, and find your voice in the middle of this and um, for me it's been a process and I'm, 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 I'm in a much better place you know I still find myself at times just getting an urge to do something and then losing it but um, I've also found new stories to tell during this time about where I am and what I'm experiencing. Um, and that feels substantial. That feels like um, possibly I could craft art that is meant to illuminate and um, inspire and show resilience and really how in the depths of something like this, the human spirit can be stronger than ever. And we've certainly seen that with all the content online. Um, a number of my friends have been doing extraordinary things, putting themselves out there. Um, the concert celebrating Stephen Sondheim the other night, that was so beautiful. So um, I think that we all just can't put pressure on ourselves, that this is the way I'm gonna deal with it. This is how I'm gonna make art. We just have to allow ourselves to grieve. This is what we are grieving. And um, the grieving process takes on a number of, of, um, of, of phases. So I think you have to allow yourself to feel that and then see what you can find coming out of it. Yes, yeah, so we, we had Mary Mitchell Campbell as one of our guests for the studio series a, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, she was in the middle of putting that project together. Uh, she's a real force. Yeah, and I know her organization very well. I've done uh, concerts for them and what an extraordinary thing that they got to do that concert in the way that yeah. they did and also to benefit the work that she's doing, which is more important than ever. It is true. Um, well, you are a master of a storyteller and I am looking forward to what uh, your version of, of this is going to be. Um, but I wanted to get, uh, go back a little bit and say, ask you how you got started in the music. Did, did you always wanted to be a Broadway composer? And when did you decide that Broadway was your future? Um, I, um, I always knew I wanted to be a musician from an early age. I was taking piano um, starting at the age of four. Wow. And um, I, I, I went through a number of different, um, I, I went through uh, different aspects of, of music. Uh, started classical, then suddenly I discovered rhythm and blues and pop. Uh, and Broadway, or musical theater I should say, didn't really come into my life uh, in terms of what I was playing until high school. Um, I, I, I remember one of the first experiences was sitting in the pit playing, or I should say being in the pit, playing the, the piano book for Kiss Me Kate. And, uh, and then I started accompanying fellow students. Uh, my sister uh, is, a, is an opera singer and also a musical theater performer, um, Catherine Kidd. And she, uh, she, um, uh, she would um, bring me repertoire that, that, that opened me up to musical theater. Uh, and then, um, when I was, uh, when I got to college, I had experienced in my senior year acting and performing uh, as, the, as Cinderella's Prince and the Wolf in, in uh, Into the Woods. And doing that musical uh, was, was just, it was a life-changing experience because uh, we were all, like, me and my, my, my castmates were just obsessed with it and talking about it and what the themes meant and, and what the hidden meaning all of these um, brilliant songs and, and scenes were. And uh, it was the first time I had investigated musical theater in that way. And um, it, was a, it was a big, big deal for me. So I think all of that was in my mind when I got to Columbia and uh, my wife, uh, uh, who I was courting at the time, Rita Pietro Pinto, uh, she suggested that I work with Brian Yorkey on what was called the Varsity Show, which is where Rogers and Hart met. Um, and um, it's got this wonderful history, uh, also, also Oscar Hammerstein and Janine Tesori and T Terrence McNally. Um, and uh, I think Brandon Victor Dixon as well. I think he, he acted in the show. I don't know if he wrote for the show, but he acted in the show. Wow. So um, it's got this great history. And I was asked to collaborate with Brian on the Centennial Varsity show, and that was my first experience writing for the musical theater. And suddenly, 
uh, my dreams of, of becoming a singer songwriter, like my hero, Billy Joel, were, would now had a new dream right beside it, which was to compose for the musical theater. I'm a huge Billy Joel fan too. I, I always figured there must be something about, you know, learning to play the piano and then Christy Brinkley. So I, 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 I knew there had to be some <coughs> connection. So I, it, it fueled many a practice session for me. So, so did you um, figure in your choice of Columbia to uh, because of musical theater and the, and the great people that went there? Or it was just, it's a great school, of course, but it was, it was after you were there that you really discovered this and the varsity show, et cetera. Yeah, exactly right. I, I, I was excited about being in New York City, but at that point when I was graduating uh, high school, it was really the singer songwriter dream that was on my mind. So I wanted to form a band. I wanted to play uh, the famous clubs in New York City and uh, have that fairy tale where an a &R person from a record label walks in, hears you, and suddenly your career is launched. We all, I don't know if any, I don't know if we all know this story, but um, the story of Bruce Springsteen, the legend of, of John Landau, uh, I think the quote is something like, I just saw the future of rock and roll and its name is Bruce Springsteen. Uh, when, he, when he saw him in a club and, and became his manager. So uh, we, we cling to that, that, that we could be Bruce and have someone come in, get us, sign us, and suddenly we launch a career that, uh, that can, can move the needle forward. Well, you, you would have to write a lot more songs about cars. You know, he, uh, I saw him on, uh, on Instagram the other day. He, he put out a version of uh, this song that I love, Land of Hope and Dreams. He always rises to this occasion. It's, kind of, it's, it's, it's really incredible that he's there at, at times like this and just, it, it means so much what he's able to offer us. The, the album, The Rising, is one of, my, one of my favorite albums of his, which came out after 9-11. And I think, going back to your first question, I've been thinking a lot about The Rising because obviously that was the, that was the album that he needed to record uh, and, and, and it meant so much to so many people this is another story, I don't know if it's true, but apparently someone saw him driving around and said, we need you now more than ever, Bruce. Can't confirm whether that's true, but I think I read that. Um, and uh, I think in terms of what I'm doing next, I, I have the rising in my mind, which is, you know, do I, do I go and try to, try to write something that, that is born out of, out, of, out of what I'm going through here? Um, and those have been the, the, the hardest places to go, but also I think um, in some ways, they, they, they feel like the, the most right places to go. Well, I'm a huge Springsteen fan. I mean, I worn out, wore out the vinyl of Born to Run, you know, many, many times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was one of my first CDs. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> um, so I want to get back to Columbia for a second again. So uh, you mentioned Brian Yorkey. Uh, what was your first impression of, of Brian? Uh, well, I know Brian's first impression of me because he said it many times in interviews that I was this backwards baseball cap wearing frat guy and took one look at me and, and, and then looked at Rita and said, really? Um, and uh, I was intimidated by Brian. Brian, um, to this day, has just uh, a, a, an infectious personality. You, you, you want to really just kind of be in his... Um, in his son's spot, you know, and, and uh, I was desperate for him to like me and to approve of me and, and to work with me. And um, when we started writing our first songs together, the collaboration felt easy and true. And uh, we forged a, a friendship that, that to this day is one of the most important in my life. And he's really, uh, he's really family. That's amazing. So after the Varsity Show was a huge success, you graduated from Columbia and headed out into the so-called real world. Uh, what were your next steps? How did you get from Columbia to Broadway? Well, uh, I had to decide that I was gonna pursue this music career and uh, I got an offer actually to, to do public finance in New York City. And okay. at that time, the mid nineties, those jobs were, were lucrative and felt like a, a great secure place to be. But I just knew that wasn't who I was and I was going to wake up in, in five or six months and have to go to that first day of work and just wonder, what am I doing here? I can't do this. So um, I turned the job offer down and got a job offer right, uh, working in a 
um, a jingle house, or a, I guess a house that does writing music for, for television. Could be commercials, could be even doing some film work. But I think they, they, they mostly uh, were, were writing television commercials. Um, and I thought, well, this would be a great place to land. But there was all this gear to learn. It was a technical job on top of everything else. And I wanted to get home and write. I wanted to get home and practice the piano. So they fired me after two months. And they did it in a very loving way. And they were right. They said, you know, you just, we just don't think you belong here. And uh, they did me the favor. So I started playing piano bar, which I did for parts of 14 years. That's a whole other story. <laughs> and, um, and Brian and I got into the BMI Musical Theater Workshop in New York City. And that's where things really started to click for us because uh, we started having songs that were well received. And then we started writing Next to Normal, which was called Feeling Electric at the end of our first year there. Um, that, yes, um, but uh, your first show on Broadway was High Fidelity, right, in 2006. Can you tell us yes. a little bit about that show and uh, what worked, what didn't, and, and what did you learn? Well, um, I think High Fidelity was definitely a big learning experience. What worked for me was the process of getting to collaborate with people you look up to, people who challenge you. Um, and uh, I wrote a score with Amanda Green uh, and a musical with Dave Lindsay Bear and, and, and Walter Bobby that I just absolutely adore. And I listen to that cast album all the time. Um, <laughs> it's great. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. And I, I orchestrated with Alex Lacamoire, Stephen Aremis did the vocal arrangements. And uh, it was produced by Jeffrey Seller, Kevin McCollum and Robin Goodman, um, three extraordinary producers. So there were a lot of pinch me moments of, wow, I'm working with this person. And, and, and then there's Nick Hornby of it all. Right. Um, who I just um, think the world of and, and look up to. And, and um, I wanted to, to really honor his work. So it was the best of intentions. It was an idea that felt inspired. And then there's an expectation that you don't see coming. There's, um, a sort of, pe people were walking into that theater with questions about the source material being adapted as a musical. And um, I think we did not, for whatever reason, um, execute on those expectations. And, and, and those questions became larger questions for, for, for most of the audiences. Um, and they couldn't answer them themselves. So, so we kind of lost them. Uh, now there were there were plenty of times I sat in that audience and they went bonkers for it, mm -hmm. so it's hard to know. Um, but I started to ask questions of myself um, as we were going into the process, and it just felt like there were so many uncertainties and um, and things that we didn't see coming that we weren't able to solve. That um, it just it just taught me everything from how you go about your process, how you, um, how you decide what you, wanna, what you wanna write about, and also what you're able to keep apart from your own process and your own expectations. So I can say, even though High Fidelity um, did not work commercially, um, and there are always gonna be people who expect a certain thing from the book or from the film that the musical, because it's a musical, didn't deliver on, um, I'm, I'm love, that musical. And uh, I, I went to an environmental production of it in Chicago, which was fantastic. And they actually got really nice reviews out there and won a bunch of awards. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's got a heart to it. And I was reminded of that when I saw the musical, what, what David and Amanda did in adapting Nick Hornby's um, brilliant characters and, and, and prose was, I just thought, extraordinary and, and moving and hilarious. <laughs> um, so, you know, you, you, you learn from every experience like that. And, and I certainly walked into Next to Normal, which had both predated and followed High Fidelity, right. um, armed with some of those lessons, but at the same time, made a bunch of mistakes all over again. <laughs> so, 
Uh, you know, if I talked about every single musical that I that I that I um, that I've worked on, I, I think it's it's dangerous to judge the success of something by um, by reviews only or by commercial success. I mean, certainly, if you have a show that succeeds on all those levels, you can say, okay, thankfully, all the stuff you went through, they, you know, everyone got it and the show's doing great. But that doesn't mean that there weren't hard lessons that you had to learn uh, getting to that place. So nothing is completely without flaws or without um, hardships. But what you hope is that going through all that stuff, you come out the other side with something that succeeds, especially as I said, going back to what we talked about earlier, which is the livelihood factor of any artist and a show needs to run for you to be able to make a living. So it was deaf, it was really difficult for me because High Fidelity, I had put so much work to the side. I thought this was gonna be my first big thing. I quit the piano bar, I quit teaching piano lessons. I had a young son um, who was uh, 18 months old and suddenly, everything stops, I don't have any work, and the show is not gonna bring you much income, and, uh, and you have to figure things out. So it also taught me, I, I, a lot of people talk about all the different projects that I have going on at one time. And that was, goes back to a lesson in high fidelity, which is you can't put all your eggs in one basket. And <laughs> thankfully, over the years, I've had other things happening, so I can find a way to support my family, um, and live in New York City and do what I love. And now with this uh, coronavirus pandemic, I'm being challenged on a level that I've never been challenged before on how I do that. Well, if there is an overachiever award for the amount of projects going on at once, Tom Kitt would be the winner of that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's something that always impressed me. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Next Normal. So it's the next show, which as you say, predates and postdates uh, High Fidelity. Next Normal was a huge critical success. And so anyone who feels like they have the formula for critical success or, or commercial success on Broadway can look at this show. It's a rock show. It's through sung. It's about mental illness. I mean, does, I, it just doesn't scream musical to a lot of people. And yet it's, it is, uh, it's really regarded as one of the greatest musical theater works of uh, not only this century, but of all times. I mean, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. So what was that pitch like? Like, how did you pitch? You were like, so I have this great show, High Fidelity. It's based on a great movie. It's got great characters, it's got all these people. All right, it didn't run as long as you wanted to, but my next one, this is about mental illness. Well, there, there, there wasn't a pitch because we started writing Next to Normal called Feeling Electric at that time in 98 at the BMI workshop. And right. Brian and I basically worked on that show uh, by ourselves for a number of years. Brian was working out in Issaquah at the Village Theater. So um, they supported us and gave us our first readings and workshops. Um, and then there was a three year hiatus where we really didn't do much work on the show. And I thought maybe, maybe it was just too difficult and um, it was a show that we were writing as kids just out of college. So to try to support yourself, write this show that's getting harder and harder to write every day. Um, it just seemed like maybe it wasn't the right thing. And then the Larson Foundation, the Jonathan Larson Foundation, along with Village Theater, who had applied on our behalf, granted us um, some money towards a workshop. And that changed everything. And we went out to, um, again, the Village Theater in 2005 and did a pivotal workshop that was followed by um, a slot at Nymph in the fall of 2005. So this was all going while I was working on High Fidelity. Nymph actually in one of our first High Fidelity readings happened at the same time. Oh. And then um, David Stone and Second Stage saw it at Nymph and signed on to, to produce it at Second Stage. So we never pitched, we just put the material out there and even though there were some people who questioned whether it could ever work, there were, there were a lot of people like uh, Kurt Deutsch and Chickaboom right. Right. and um, Amanda Dubois, um, you know, who always believed in the piece. Uh, Peter Askin, who directed and um, financed that NIMF production. Um, and um, 
and then of course landing with David and, and, and Carol and Chris Burney, um, Carol Rothman and Chris Burney right. at uh, Second Stage. And um, I'll never forget when the reviews came out for High Fidelity, um, which was really devastating that morning, David and Carol and um, uh, James Lapine, who, um, who I was working with at that, at that point, um, and um, uh, Brian, of course, all reached out to me um, just to give their love and say, you gotta keep going. You know, this is something that people go through and we expect you to get back to work. <laughs> so, um, so, so we did subsequent readings, 2006, uh, at second stage and then another one. Uh, and, and then, uh, or I should say, no, we did the one in 2006 and that, and that's where second stage said, okay, we're going to slot the show. And then 2007, eight, 2000, 2007, 2008 season was where the show debuted. And we got very mixed reviews at second stage. So the journey to become commercial and, 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 and to have enough critics, um, support the show, uh, really didn't just start when we did our first production. We had a lot of work to do and we went to arena stage. Molly Smith invited us to, to come work with her at arena, which was phenomenal place to be and we did a lot of important work on the show and um and then we got great reviews in dc and that's what brought us back to new york so um next to normal was 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 something an 11 year journey from bmi to broadway and a lot of fits and starts along the way to get to the place where it suddenly was oh here's this musical that works and you wouldn't have uh, you wouldn't have expected it yes um, yeah, I, I've talked to many composers on, on the series so far, and, and uh, many of them say it's the hardest show to get is your second show. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, I, I, don't, I wouldn't call uh, Next Normal the second show because it was in process. I think right. a more accurate second show, especially for Brian and I, would be If Then. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would point to that example for us. I think If Then is our, is our second album. Right. And um, right. as such, as second albums go, there are people who love it. There are people who don't think it's nearly as good as the first. But I think on subsequent listenings, you start to realize, oh, there's something here that I didn't see. And I even felt that because I put it on early in the pandemic, hadn't listened to it in a while, mm -hmm. and was struck by so much of what Brian and I created in a way that I, I, I wasn't before. I, I texted Adina just to say, I'm listening to this right now, and I'm so moved by it and uh, so proud of it. So, um, yeah, If Then is like, I think the, the quintessential musical theater second album. <laughs> well, I wanted to get back to Next Normal for just a second. Um, so this is actually a question for one of my students. Uh, Kayla asks, what, what persuaded you to tell the story of Next Normal in a rock style, yet sung through like an opera? And how did this medium enhance the storytelling of the piece? We always conceived of Next to Normal as a mostly rock musical. I wouldn't characterize it as a rock musical just because I think, I think the term rock musical was used in, uh, at a time when rock was not common. So it would um, label a show that was using a style that was outside the norm of theater. And um, now uh, it's, there are so many styles that, that are natural to musical theater. Uh, it seems like to label anything, uh, this kind of musical um, just doesn't do justice to what we do. I mean, we're all working in different styles. Yeah, but I, 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 the, I want to remind the readers or the listeners that uh, when, when Rent opened, uh, they deliberately did not call it, a, or they didn't want to call it a rock musical. The, the, the people who marketed Rent because of that, what you were talking about, you know. It, well, you don't, there are some people that don't, uh, that, that, that maybe that would scare them about how loud it's going to be or, um, so I think, and, and there, and those are probably, a lot of those people probably wouldn't realize it's rock or would, or would fall into it. if They didn't know what they were expecting. Right. So yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to influence anybody's expectations before they walk in the, in the door. Um, but we at that, we were very influenced by Rent and Hedwig and the Angry Inch and hair 
um, and Tommy. So uh, I should say when we are always influenced by the shows, but but we specifically were pointing to the shows when we talked about feeling electric. Mm-hmm. Um, so we knew we wanted to es- express ourselves through rock, but as, as we continued exploring the piece, songs like I Dream, although I, I Dream a Dance, I Dream to Dance is actually one of the first songs we wrote. So even then we knew that we were going to explore other styles and things like every, songs like uh, Everything Else, My Psychopharmacologist and I, and How Could I Ever Forget, um, even The Haze, uh, even though they have a folk quality to them, then go into something orchestral. And I, I just love all of Michael Sterevin's work on it. So, um, so anyway, we, we knew that, that we want, and we knew we, that we wanted it to be operatic, just how much dialogue uh, was the question, but we tried to get it down to the bare minimum because we just felt that the songs were doing something really important and um, just felt like the way that the, the, the engine that the, that, that the show wanted. And um, it also heightened everything that they were feeling. A musical is all about singing heightened emotions. So uh, because this family is living in heightened emotions, it felt like the score was really good to heavy lifting. So as a composer, how do you find the sound for a show? Like different, you talk about how connected the rock musical is, obviously the rock sound is the next normal. Do you, do you have a favorite style to write in? Is, how is it influenced by the story that you're telling? Um, I think people who have followed my career probably, I have a style, I think. I mean, I think that there are songs going to different places, but I, I can feel that when I'm writing. Um, so then the question is, what's the, is there a specific style to the music? If then, for example, I wanted to, I wanted to be a little folky, I wanted it to evoke to me, the Simon and Garfunkel romanticism of New York City. Mm. Um, and uh, in some places I did that, in some places I didn't. It kind of went away from that a little bit. Um, superhero, which is a, um, a, a very personal show that I just love that was at Second Stage a year ago, uh, just over a year ago. And uh, yesterday it was National Superhero Day. <laughs> so that's another that's another cast recording that I've been listening to quite a bit. That's the songs suddenly mean very different things to me now. Hearing them, um, so um, for that, I was I was uh, thinking back on my experience of seeing Superman the first time in the movie theater and how the John Williams um, prelude and fanfare just blew me away. So I wanted to wanted to have that kind of spirit and galvanizing energy in the show. Um, but also uh, leave away from that and go into different places. And um, so I, I think I just try to take the moment I'm writing in and then usually the, the music starts to form from there. Uh, and then you have to say, okay, is this the right song to be writing for this? Is this the right style? Does this evoke the character's emotions in the way that I need to? And um, then you rely on your collaborators to tell you if you're on the mark or not. That's amazing. Um, one of uh, what's so interesting to me personally about your career is that you're not just this amazing composer, but a an arranger and an orchestrator all at the same time, which oddly enough is is quite rare in musical theater industry. Um, and could you just uh, tell our listeners, like, explain what those three jobs are? Uh, because they're very distinct, even though, you know, sometimes you wear both hats on a certain production. You just explain the difference between them and then some of the challenges of arranging and orchestrating versus composing. Well, if I'm an arranger orchestrator, the, arra- uh, the, the arrangement comes first. So, um, for example, if I'm working on Jagged Little Pill, I have to go through the piano book and working on the piano and doing vocal arrangements, start to figure out the energy of the songs, how different characters um, exist within the song now. Uh, Are there modulations as you go from character to character or just an overall key change? Does the song begin harder or softer? Um, 
And do you, what are the, what are the different colors you find? So that all gets put down into a piano vocal score. So that the arrangement has happened. I've arranged that song and we're working with it in rehearsal. Then you take that arrangement, you say, now what does that mean for the instruments and the orchestra that are gonna be playing this? And that's when the orchestration comes in and you take those arrangements and I'll look at, if, if you're, if you're um, an orchestrator not working with the arranger, it's separate jobs, you'll look at all of the voicings, the melody lines that are in the piano part, and you'll, you'll wanna keep those intact as you assign the parts. Um, so the, the, the arrangement is the blueprint for the orchestration. Um, the composer uh, is not unlike the arranger, but you're starting from scratch. So everything in that piano vocal has never lived in any form before. Um, and so, uh, you know, as opposed to an orchestrator who, if you're working with an arrangement of existing material, you might have a, a sense of where you might take it based on what's there already, the composition is brand new. And so um, for, for Jagged Little Pill, there were moments where I was faithful to the record. There were moments where um, I added some new things or even might have departed a little bit. Um, and then there were two brand new compositions that I got to orchestrate from the ground up, which was really exciting. In, in Jagged Little Pill, uh, were you working directly with Alanis Morissette or were you working with uh, her recordings, basically? Both. What was both? It was both, yeah. I, 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 I referenced the recordings quite a bit, as you can imagine. But uh, she was in the room with us and she was hugely supportive and helpful and had great ideas that I would incorporate. Um, so uh, so it, was, it was really both and... Um, uh, you know, it's it's funny. Like I just thinking of Alanis. I, I I miss her. I miss our show. I hope I hope we'll be back soon. Mm. Uh, she's someone who she she's connected with us and reached out to us. Alanis is someone that you leave a conversation more enlightened than when you began it with her. She just has real soulfulness and a depth and understanding of the human uh, uh, of the human experience and. Jagged Little Pill was really a lesson for me in that, and, um, and she continues to be that in the world right now. Well, we, we uh, interviewed Matt Dobler on Monday, and oh, great. He, who was working for Jagged Little Pill, and yeah, yeah. he's a big, big fan as well. Uh, I want to go a little bit deeper in the, here because um, I, I think a lot of people uh, who don't know your craft, or, or you know, generally the craft of writing musicals, think the composer really does come up with everything, right? Like the, you know, great dance arrangement in the middle of Kiss Me Kate was something that sprung out of Cole Porter's pen, right? And, 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 and that, that doesn't happen, right? The composer, uh, and some composers give a lot more information to their arrangers and the orchestrator than, than some. I, I would imagine, I'm assuming, you, when you're working with an orchestrator like Michael Sturban, you give them a, a pretty solid blueprint of what you want. First of all, is that correct? <laughs> that is correct, yeah, and that's why I try to write everything down specifically. Um, you know, people work in different ways, and now that we have things like Logic and Ableton, um, people can create tracks for themselves. So um, the medium has really changed, but I just love to work on the piano. I love to, um, I love to work, work out the different harmonies, and, and melodic contours. Um, and I find the piano to be such an evocative instrument. So when Michael gets something from me, it's, it's usually pretty thought out. Uh, and, and then Michael will bring his own um, writing hat to it because orchestrating is really writing. And there have been times where I've heard a little thing, he's, he's changed the harmony or he's, he's, uh, he's, he's shifted the root of the chord a little bit. And um, sometimes I'll say, well, no, I kind of like what I did. Or sometimes I'll say, that's really cool, Michael. That's really cool. Um, in Superhero, I was just listening to this yesterday, in the opening prologue, um, uh, he's, there's this big note that, that the character of Simon sings when he goes, he is there. And at the end, the piano part, uh, the, the orchestration goes, bum, 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 bum. And then the bass line shifts. So it's on an F and then it shifts down a third. And, I, and then rises back to the F for the final chord. Um, and it totally changes the, 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 
the harmony of that. Um, and I had kept it on the F the entire time, just this constant build. And it was just, it was just like this little tiny thing that he did, um, little shift that, that, that created some tension that was, that was really wonderful. So even a little thing like that, every time I hear it, I appreciate my goal. And, uh, but yeah, for, for all composers, the more control you want over how you're hearing it in your head, the more information you give to your arranger or your orchestrator. That's that's great. My my follow up to that really is that um, many composers who are listed as composers of musicals don't give that much information, right? And 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 some of them like don't even read music, right? So have have you worked with people like that as an arranger on a project like that? And and, and what is that like? And how how much does your composing hat you have to to put on in that kind of situation? Um, I think that you just. I, I, I consider anything that I get from the composer to be the piano vocal. That's just my term for it, whether it's a demo or, um, or a lead sheet um, with a melody or a full, fully scored piano part. Um, but you just have to say, this is how the artist has always um, spoken. If they have to put their song down into some form that can be translated. So I guess the best example of that would be SpongeBob. Right. Where um, I don't think that I got one piece of music from any of the artists. <laughs> um, and I, I expected that, you know, because I think that they were, they were told that, they, that, that, the, um, that, that they were going to have to submit a lyric sheet and a demo. Um, and I have, I have perfect pitch, thankfully, which allows me to, have, so, so my ear is very well trained and I can hear something and tell you what it is pretty quickly. So, um, so that was fine to take, to get the songs in that form. Some of them were more fully realized demos than others. Some were just kind of scratch tracks or a voice memo. Um, and, uh, so, so I had a, a major creative process on my own to get them down arrange them, vocal arrange them, and then orchestrate them um, on every song. And, uh, and, then, and then I was a dance arranger on that too. So there were plenty of things that I invented. Um, the, uh, the dance break for I'm Not a Loser, the big tap moment, um, a lot of stuff in the opening number, um, all that incidental music. And then I also in SpongeBob wrote my own original music for transitions and um, and big action moments, uh, or just you know animated moments, because um, obviously the world of SpongeBob is going to have a lot of music underneath those characters' actions. So, um, so that was that was a challenging but really exciting process because if you look at the roster of artists that I got to work with, it's you know it's a murderer's row, and uh, I just felt lucky to 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 get that honor to work on on those songs and. Um, you know, hopefully all of the artists felt, felt uh, the honor back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they did. I, I, I just want to stop and uh, explain to our visitors that Tom is understating what a monumental task this is. I mean, the, the, the amount of work that is involved from transcribing something from a, uh, a voice memo on an iPhone and creating a fully realized arrangement, dance arrangement, orchestration uh, is is an untold amount of hours of work, and you're you're being very uh, uh, understated about this. So, I, it, since you won't be, I will be. Um, it's it's an <laughs> enormous amount of work, and uh, it takes somewhat of a, a extraordinary talent. So, just give you props there. <laughs> so. Um, I did want to talk about notation for a second. Um, and so music, music notation is, is almost by definition limited. And uh, what you, you know, you're, a, a, you know how to write something to weigh how it's, it's, it's going to be played on an instrument or, I mean, you, that's, that is your craft, right? But a vocalist and many of our people who are out there are, are actresses and actors who are going to be interpreting your work. And when they get a, a piece of music, uh, 
uh, sheet music that was uh, written or arranged or composed or whatever by Tom Kitt. What, what are your expectations of sticking to exactly what's written or what kind of flexibility there is in interpretation? I think that if you're working on an established piece of music, um, you should approach it that what's written down is, is, is how it's meant to be performed. Uh, and I will also notate in certain places an ad lib uh, expression. Um, but I'm very specific about, for example, where you might, where there's rhythm notation and you speak it and, uh, and when I'm writing a riff. Um, so uh, if you're studying next to normal, um, you know, there, I think, the pop world, the pop rock world probably lends itself more to some interpretation if there's big singing going on and there's a, a vocal moment. But, um, but I think that, um, I think you wanna treat that material um, as something that's documented and, um, and there's an expectation to, to sing what's on the page. I think when you're in a workshop, or reading, and you're working on material that is evolving, there's definitely, at least for me, more of a desire to have a collaboration once you learn what's on the page. So I've had, I've had actors not even realize they're doing it, um, do little tiny shifts in the rhythm of something, putting the emphasis on a different syllable, or making um, a 16th note here, um, you know, instead of da 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 becomes da da da, you know, things like that, um, that just feel more natural. So I learn a lot from the performer in the development process. And uh, I'll look at a piece of music and think, wow, did I really, I wrote it that way? It sounds much better the way they're doing it. Um, or you make a suggestion and say, well, what do you think about this? Or I really feel like this could lift here. Um, in, uh, in Superhero, in the song, um, it's not like in the movies, Bryce Pinkham at the top of the bridge when he sings, no one knows it's me and he, me becomes this big note. I'd written an F sharp and he asked me if he could take it a third higher to an A. And I didn't write that because I just thought I'm not going to be cruel and make someone jump an octave and sing a high A, but he wanted it and he could do it. And it was thrilling. Um, so there's something I wouldn't have even thought of without Bryce's suggestion. So um, now there's also, you know, I've seen people for auditions, have a take on something, perform something in a different, I saw someone do a very angry kind of edgy version of part of your world, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I think they sang the notes, they just sang it with less of the dreaminess and a little bit more like they were, like they were angry that they weren't up there with the human beings. So um, I think you can be creative, but I think that um, if you're really studying something, um, the way you would study opera, I think musical theater has the same uh, process. How do you feel about uh, people auditioning for you singing your own material? Uh, I mean, except for the show that you're doing, like from a different show. I think it's fine. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was told early on when it wasn't me, when I was, if I was a musical director sitting in the room with the composer, that it maybe is not the best thing to bring in the composer's work. Um, but for me personally, I'm always hugely flattered when someone brings in a song of mine. I've had people bring in songs of mine and not even know that I wrote them or not know that it was me. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, when, when they discover or to find out that they discovered when they left the room. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I would say if you're going to do it, it's the, the composer is going to be really knowledgeable about their song. Now, if you're singing, obviously, if you're singing songs from the show, that's one thing. But if you're, if you're asked to bring in any song and sing uh, 32 bars or whatever it is, um, it could go really well or, or, or um, you just don't know what the composer's response is going to be. But yeah. for me, I encourage it just because I'm all, I, it, it, it's, uh, it's always a thrill to see performers do my material. That's great.
Um, so you've had the opportunity to collaborate with some amazing people in your career. You, you just talked about people from High Fidelity. Um, so who do you feel has been especially significant as a mentor along your artistic journey? That's a really good question. You know, I, I don't know if it's only people I've worked with because sometimes the people you work with, you're in the trenches with them. Sure. I, I, I've, uh, I've worked with, as you said, some of the greatest collaborators you could ever ask for. So I don't know if I can necessarily say that, um, uh, I mean, well, maybe, like, outs maybe outside of like Brian Yorkie, for example, is, sure. is, is, you know, that's its own thing. Cause Brian and I grew up together and we got into this business together. Right. Um, and, and we had the garage band musical theater dreams. So, um, so, but, but really, uh, everybody I've worked, you know, I, I, I can point to Hal Prince, uh, who I miss dearly. We all uh, do. And was a great mentor and gave me lots of important advice. Um, Tell me a Hal Prince story, because everyone has one. Um, trying to figure what my, one of my favorites would be. Um, you know, Hal, uh, Hal came up to me right away after High Fidelity. Um, I mean, it was, it was, it was month, a few months after. And, um, and he just was, he was so supportive and he said, you got to keep going. And he told me a version of, of, of his famous quote, which lots of people have, have, have pointed to, which is that, uh, the morning after he opened the show, he always took a meeting on his next one, just to say that I'm going to, no matter what happens tonight, I'm going forward to my next project. But he talked about West Side Story and how that was a mixed, um, experience for him when that show opened. It wasn't a home run. Uh, I think he told me that um, he was maybe one of the only people that showed up at the Tony Awards. You know, people were, just wasn't um, seen as a success at that point that we know it is. I so, um, and, and he just talked about the, the, the challenges he went through um, and how he had a period of shows that didn't go the way he wanted. And I just thought, wow. Hal Prince went through this, and <laughs> Hal Prince is taking the time to talk to me about it. So I must be doing something right. Yes, well, a lot of people don't know that, uh, don't remember at least that West Side Story lost the Best Tony Award to, of all things, yeah. The Music Man. <laughs> so. You know, those things, we, we talk about awards a lot, and, and, and they're, they're very important, especially to launch a show or an artist, but, um, there's so many deserving things and they're deserving things that uh, you look at, you look at four or five people in a category. Um, it's, a, it's hard because, because so, so, you know, to say that one should have happened over the other, <laughs> Sorry. Um, say that one should have happened over the other or, you know, to play sort of woulda, coulda, it's just, I don't know. I, I never like to do that. And, and, um, I think it's always just a wonderful thing to be nominated. And I've, we've all been at that place where we're not in, even invited to that party. And, and that's hard, but there have been plenty of people over the years who um, have been deserving and, and, and have been left off that list. So um, I think that it's a dangerous thing to define by that. Um, but that being said, um, next to normal and, and you know, the Tony Awards and the Pulitzer Prize were hugely important to that show's life, and um, and it's one of the greatest moments that I've ever had. So um, it's 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 a huge deal when it happens, um, and uh, if it does, you just have to know that that uh, it's a special special thing. You don't know if it will happen again. You just have to really enjoy the moment. That that's just amazing. Um... So before we move on to the Pivot questionnaire, I want to ask you uh, one last thing here. So you've been super active in the last five years. And in fact, I've seen Freaky Friday at the Playhouse and Almost Famous at the Globe and Jagged Little Pill on Broadway. I've got to see all three of these things and can't believe it's the same person. Good for you. That's <laughs> my daughter. Yeah. She's my daughter. 
<laughs> That's totally fine. Um, so I love all three of these shows and, and I you know, wish success for all of them. But you have two other shows that were in rehearsals or just about to open in New York. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, so there's Flying Over Sunset at Lincoln Center, which has already been announced for the fall. Uh, I, I pray and cross my fingers every day that fall will bring a much different landscape than the spring has. Right. Um, Which theater is that going to be in? The Vivian Beaumont at Lincoln right. Center. The big house, right. And that's a, a really exciting piece. It's a, um, based on, um, uh, based on true, true facts and um, characters, um, Aldous Huxley, Claire with Luce, um, Cary Grant and Gerald Hurd were all um, experimenting with LSD in the 1950s. And so the musical chronicles where they are in their life at a certain point and how they're experimenting with the drug on their own. And then it brings them all together to experience the drug at Claire's uh, rental house in Malibu. I love that. Aldous Huxley, that's just amazing. And yeah, there's a really cool story. Uh, there's a second. There's a second one too that you're working on. Yes, there's the visitor, right? Which is um, uh, an adaptation of the beautiful Tom McCarthy film from 2007 about uh, undocumented immigrants in New York City, um, a friendship that struck between uh, a Syrian, a uh, young Syrian man who plays the djembe, his girlfriend from Senegal, and um, a sixty-something. Um, a white uh, male college professor at Connecticut College. And um, they come together through um, extenuating circumstances, sort of accidental, accidentally, and they, they forge a, a, a friendship, especially Tarek and uh, Walter. And then um, Tarek is uh, detained and uh, the story shifts in tone. And um, it's a very timely and beautiful story um, it was timely in 2007. Um, I think, um, sadly, even more so in 2020. And um, it's really a story about the, the human spirit and what it is to um, what what it is to 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 fight for something, and how how we should truly see one another as human beings in this world, um, and be inclusive and be loving and how art can transcend and, and teach us um, because art awakens in this show. Mm. Um, and it's at the public theater, which is the perfect place for it. And um, you know, another, another you mentioned mentors, Oscar Eustace, he's a hugely important person um, in my life. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just moved that the show is happening there. And you can see actually online a few weeks before everything shut down, we recorded uh, the song called Heart in Your Hands. Um, and it's, uh, you can find it on YouTube. Um, Ariel Stachel, who won the Tony Award for the band's visit, uh, is featured in the song along with our ensemble and David Hyde Pierce, who plays Walter, is playing the djembe by him. And it's really, it's, 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 it's quite interesting that as I watch that in these days, I, I see expressions on David's face that almost pointed to him knowing this was all happening. I'm very moved by it. Um, but anyway, you, you can see it online and it's, it's, it's a song I'm really proud of. Uh, and it's a story I'm proud to tell. And Tom McCarthy is just one of those essential artists, movies like, like The Visitor, of course, and, and Spotlight. Um, and um, to get to work on his material, to get to write the score with Brian, um, and um, to be with, with Oscar and um, the brilliant Mandy Hackett, who works with him. Uh, at the public theater um, is also um, quite quite an honor. So we don't know when, uh, but um, the set was already in the building because we were going to begin tech. And um, so we'll just have to see when we can all get back to doing what we love. There's, there's obviously no, um, no sense of that, but it, it was nice to have some hope today that there seems to be a drug that perhaps is working and, um, and these extraordinary scientists who are, who are working, um, who are taking a, what I know is a 12 to 18 month vaccine 
timeline and are, and are doing their best to shrink that down and, and, and give us all something that we can look towards. It's, it's, uh, I, was, I, I was talking with Cameron Crowe, I said, I said, you know, science today, it's kind of like if you look at the 1960s when the Beatles and Bob Dylan and the Rolling Stones um, and the birds were, were all kind of one-offing each other or one-upping each other, I should say, with albums, it's like that this, this, this is a extraordinary time for science and, and I'm, uh, I'm just so in awe of what they're doing, how fast they're working, these healthcare workers who are true superheroes. Um, you know, in, in, as I said, in the, in the depths of all this are, are extraordinary examples of the human spirit and creativity and ingenuity. Um, and uh, those are the stories that I'm following because they give me hope. Well, thank you so much for your inspiring words. That's, I think it, it is a balm for all of us listening who are anxious and worried about themselves and the future and the future of art and the future of just the future. So thank you so much. Look, we artists are, are as important now as we've ever been. And, um, you know, I especially say to the, the, the young people, um, and hopefully I'm still fairly young, but when I say young, my children, and especially people who are, who are in college or graduating into the world, um, you know, I think, I think we all need to wake up. This is, you know, and, 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 and there are plenty of people who have been uh, who have woken up, but um, we have to protect our world and, um, and we have to always be shining a light on important issues um, and educating ourselves and really deciding what kind of world we want to live in um, and not letting people shout you down who just have a bigger pulpit or more resources. Um, I do what I can to put the art in the world that is not just going to entertain, um, but also it's going to say something I want to say. Um, and, um, you know, the, we, I know we're all doing it. We're all walking around just in a daze. Some of the things that are said and some of the things that were in place that got us to this point and the resurgence of science, it's just got to be a part of the equation, um, with everything that we're doing, because now that's, who's going to save us. So the fact that we allowed some of these programs to be slashed or we allowed science to take a back seat and people to sort of, who didn't have the expertise to diminish that role, um, you know, we all have, that can't happen. And so we as artists have to be mobilized and, um, and everyone has to fight for the world they wanna live in um, and, 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 and to learn lessons. The way I learn lessons from a flop, <laughs> um, you know, we all have to learn lessons and we have to, we have to really fight hard um, to protect ourselves and our children and our children's children um, and make this a world that we can, we can live in and be able to go back and be in the theater and be with one another. That's amazing. Every, everyone has to fight for the world they want to live in. That's, those are great words. Uh, we're going to move on to the Pavot questionnaire here. This is, uh, these are 10 questions that originally came from a French television series called Bouillon de Culture. It was hosted by Bernard Pivot, uh, but they're better known as the questions that James Lipton used to ask his guests at the end of every Inside the Actors studio television show. So there are 10 questions. And the first question is, what is your favorite word? My favorite word. <laughs> Um, wow, that's a really good question. Um, I would say the first word that comes to mind is warm. Hmm. What is your least favorite word? My least favorite word. Um, probably some words that I can't say, but... Uh, There's no rating on this. <laughs> And I don't know if your parents are listening, so. <laughs> um, it's probably become the word amazing. And I would say it's just because I, I, I find myself using it and I find that, that, that we all use it quite a bit. So, um, and there, there are other words like that that we use when, we, when, when we're talking. I, I, I hate you know that, I, that, I, that I, if I ever say that, you know, you know. But, but I think amazing is sometimes an easy or incredible, that's another one. Those are easy adjectives that we can go to. So I'm always trying to find different ways to express myself. If I start saying the word amazing over and over, 
then I know that I'm just kind of treading water. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, I would say beautiful dissonance. So something that has beauty to it, but has a sadness, has something that has a little bit of, a, of, of an edginess or um, something that just makes your, your heart ache. There's a lot of that in, in, in romantic music, I find. Um, listening to something like Claire de Lune, for example, or Stephen Sondheim. Right. Um, but, but yeah, anything that, that, that uh, I find Appalachian Spring has that. I've been listening to that a lot. Mm -hmm. Something so romantic and gorgeous about it. And then there are these colors that Copeland writes in different instrumentation um, that just bring tears to your eyes. So I like beautiful dissonance. What turns you off? Um, I would say people who spout wisdom through lack of experience or knowledge. Anyone who comes at you in conversation or stands on any platform and spouts expertise about something that they have no expertise in um, or won't listen to what you're saying because they're just right, <laughs> won't have a conversation and just professes to be right without examining a conversation. Anyone who does that is, is something that, that turns me off. So what is your favorite curse word? My favorite curse word? Yeah. Um, I'm just the old standby fuck. I think fuck is a satisfying word to say. Totally. What sound or noise do you love? Um, what sound or noise do I love? Hmm. Uh, the, the, the calm breathing of my children when they're sleeping. What sound or noise do you hate? Um, the sound of my children screaming in the house or my dog barking uncontrollably. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, wow. Attempt, meaning that I could do it or, I mean, I, I, if I could have another- Pipe dream. <laughs> I dream, uh, I always want to play first base for the New York Yankees. <laughs> what profession would you not like to do? Oh, wow. Well, I'll say this from experience. When I was, uh, <laughs> when I was in college, my, my freshman year of college, I did not, um, get a job in time. I was, I was left without a summer job. My mom asked the man at the, at, the, at the IGA supermarket if I could bag groceries. So I spent the summer bagging groceries. That is not a job that I would love to return to. No disrespect for anyone who bags groceries but having gone through it and been a grocery bagger. But I will say this, yeah. people who are bagging groceries right now are heroes. Yes, they are. You know, they are, they are, um, essential workers and they are doing a great service and, and they, are, they are heroes. So if I was bagging groceries right now, I'd be very proud of that job. The 10th question is, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? <laughs> well done. <laughs> very good, very good. So we're gonna turn to questions from, the, from our audience here. Thank you for submitting these questions. Uh, if you have any more, <coughs> just uh, type them into the question and answer or Zoom function. So this question is from Jamie Buxton. Uh, she says, hi, Tom, thank you so much for being here. I saw Next Normal three times on Broadway and every time it affected me very deeply. 
Uh, I never saw the previous incarnations and was wondering what changes were made on the road to Broadway. And then if you knew the show was ready or if the timing told you, like what, how did you know the show was ready or did you just run out of time? Well, there were a number of changes. Um, significant ones were, we originally had Diana breaking down in a Costco charm song that did not quite work as, 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 as smart as we thought we were in writing it, it was not, we would lose the audience. So we cut that, we actually cut that in New York and then, yeah. and then continued fine tuning it in DC. Something we cut in DC that we should have cut in New York was the end of the first act. The doctor had another rock moment, a dreamy rock sequence for Diana and this big production number called Feeling Electric happened and he would pull off his scrubs and his gown and suddenly be in like a leather outfit and um, you know, be a rock star. And it, it just, it, it, it was not our, we thought it was again, an inspired fantastical moment. And the audience just, we had them after light in the dark and then we lost them with that song. So um, cutting that was a huge, huge thing. Letting, trusting that the act could end on light in the dark and then writing, wish, wish I Were Here for the top of act two. With a show like Next to Normal, um, that was opening in a financial crisis, which hopefully that financial crisis won't seem like um, uh, a great thing compared to what we're going through now. So, um, but, but at that time, uh, the Great Recession, 2008, many shows had closed. Uh, in that January. And so the idea that we were bringing Next to Normal to Broadway was um, was certainly not necessarily uh, the way you would envision that the timing was right for, um, for, for the show. So I don't know if I ever thought the timing was right, but I, but, I, but I definitely felt like after the work we had done in DC, the response of the critics and the audiences in DC, I just felt like I don't, I don't, I don't know about timing. I know that the show is ready, and um, and I, 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 if if everyone's game, then let's see what happens. Because watching the show, even for a week on Broadway, with with Alice Ripley getting to to sing those songs, and and and, and those other brilliant cast members, and Michael Greif's beautiful work, and our, our entire design design team and music team and just that would have been a thrill. So um, thankfully David Stone, another mentor and very important person in my life, thankfully David um, brought the show to Broadway and uh, it changed my life. I want a follow up to that. Um, I mean, you mentioned how uh, through this whole interview, how important the collaborative process is. And um, it's, Talk about the nature of feedback for a moment. Um, so what you probably get a lot of feedback from a lot of people, people on your team and people from outside of your team. My question is, what, what makes good feedback? Like, uh, how can you distinguish something that's helpful from something that's not helpful? This was a really important lesson that they taught us at BMI, and I think it's still true. Um, and one of the, I think one of the best things that we learned if you're giving feedback for your own ego or basically saying, well, if I wrote it, here's how I would do it. Um, or if you just don't like something, then your feedback's not gonna be helpful. If you look at it and say, I think I know what, you, what you're trying to do. And here are some thoughts about why it's not necessarily landing for me. Um, you know, here's a suggestion of how you can get here a different way. Um, and you can take yourself out of it and just try to put yourself in their shoes. Um, and you genuinely want the, the show to succeed, then your feedback is gonna be coming from the right place. There's a lot of questions about American Idiot on, on here. And uh, uh, I, I should tell everyone, you and everybody else that Carmel Dean is going to be on the studio series on Friday. He served as, as your music director for, for American Idiot. I'm a big fan. So um, let's see if I can try to do this. So 
Uh, <laughs> Andrew Esker writes, do you prefer, like, basically what, what was the collaboration like with Green, the band members of Green Day and Billy Joe? Uh, and was it different than collaborating with other, uh, other people? What was, what was that like? It was amazing. It was yeah. different in some ways. It was similar in some ways. We had to get the band's permission. So there was a lot of work I had to do on the arrangements before I even met them. Mm -hmm. just to get their sign off and then once they were uh, once they gave approval then we were all able to meet um they would give us new songs or old songs that no one knew um so we used i think three songs off of 21st century breakdown we used know your enemy 21 guns last night on earth we used lobotomy uh before the lobotomy um and then we used a song called um, When It's Time, which, um, um, which, which was a, um, uh, a song that Billy Joe wrote for his wife, Adrian, when they were teenagers. Um, so um, the fact that the band was opening up their material to us in that way, and Alanis did the same thing on Jagged Little Pill, uh, it just felt like uh, you, this great honor to be able to have these Green Day songs before anyone else heard them and get to work on them. Uh, and then I actually ended up doing some arrangements on 21st Century Breakdown, some string arrangements, and a couple of things on um, Uno Dos Tre. So uh, my theater dream, my theater world pulled me into the rock world, which was really exciting. But um, they, 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 they came to Vassar, they were there in Berkeley with us for a good amount of time. And um, there were some things that we, we had to change too that, that um, they were really open to. We, we rewrote lyrics in certain places, or I should say Billy Joe rewrote lyrics in certain places. You know, we would have suggestions um, about certain things. Sometimes they would sign off on those or um, take it away and make their own stab. Rock and Roll Girlfriend was I think a last thing that we had to try to put in the world of the show and the lyrics. In, on the album uh, didn't quite make sense. So, um, so, so, so those were all, those, those were probably as big as it got. And, and, and a lot of it was just, uh, it felt like we found our footing early with that show and um, what it meant for the design team, what it meant for the projections. Um, it was a thrilling process and it just felt like every step of the way we were discovering what we needed to, to be discovering. There's, there's a follow-up question here and the question answers. Um, as the composer or arranger or orchestrator uh, on any of these projects, how collaborative <laughs> are you How collaborative are you on the story elements? Um, I, I, I'm collaborative mm -hmm. uh, because in the room, you're speaking for the music. So you, you have your composer hat on mm -hmm. and the story is gonna affect your arrangements or vice versa. So um, I was pulled into the story conversations on Jagged. I was pulled into the story conversations on American Idiot. Um, I talked with Tina and Kyle during SpongeBob quite a bit. Just sometimes I wasn't asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, head over heels. Uh, there's, a, uh, um, there's a reprise that I wrote for the end of the show, it was a Mad About You reprise where all the couples come together. And that's something I conceived and it, it shaped the story. So um, it's, it's, it's an important job and I would never overstep. And I know that I'm not the book writer. Um, so I always try to do it respectfully. Um, but uh, hopefully you earn the trust of the creative team. And if you come and say, I had a thought, they'll want to hear it. All right. Well, it's, it's what's so fascinating to me, I mean, your career is just, very broad and and many of your shows have kind of a jukebox musical form to them where you're taking something that has an existing recording soundtrack like the songs of Alanis Morissette or uh, the songs of Green Day and, and putting it into a show and um, you know it I just want to explain to the rest of people listening that it's it really is the medium of a book writer and an arranger to make these shows happen as much as 
you know, it's the lyricist and songwriter for Rodgers and Hammerstein, right? It, because the, the songs are already there, the lyrics are already there, the, the tunes are already there. Um, so uh, what, what can you tell us about uh, approaching a show from a creative standpoint um, where the songs are already written, that, that they just need to be arranged and put in the right order to tell a story? Well, you have to do two things. You have to both honor the material and make sure that people coming to the show are gonna experience what they, what they expect and what they love about it. Because as, as I've said many times, um, Jagged Little Pill, American Idiot, the music of the Go-Go's, um, all of those brilliant artists on SpongeBob, they are iconic artists making life-changing classic music, music that people revere. And um, so they don't need me to come in, I mean, it's already um, an achievement um, that will stand the test of time and is, and is considered to be among the most important things ever written. Um, so, so I don't want to mess with that. And everyone's going to know because they know the original versions. Thank you, Julia. Sorry, I just asked my daughter to bring me in some water. So, you know, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, everyone's going to know my work. And um, so I have to make sure that um, I am honoring what's there and, and really asking important questions when I'm investigating certain things. At the same time, it is an adaptation and the songs are in a different context and what works in the studio um, can be different for what works in, um, uh, in, in a show. So you have to make sure that you allow yourself a freedom. And I always tell the artists, I, I, I consider myself to be kind of a George Martin type figure where your compositions will stay intact, but I may add some layers that hopefully will feel like they're important new parts of these songs, but they are your songs. So if there was ever anything that bugged you um, or you felt took away from it, I will happily rewrite. Can you give us an example of a song that <coughs> that really departed from the original studio recording uh, on, on purpose that was particularly successful? Um, sure. Well, I think that um, an example in American Idiot is the final song, What's Her Name? Sure. Which on the album has this fantastic sort of muted guitar, bass drum groove. Uh, but I felt like in the show after Homecoming in this very big um, penultimate statement that um, we needed to start from a little more um, of a somber feeling. Johnny needed to pick up the pieces a little bit. He couldn't just feel like he was in motion. And certainly there's a version where the, ver where the album groove I'm sure would have worked and worked um, beautifully. But I just wanted to try something different. I wanted to see what would happen. I called Michael Mayer, said I've got this crazy idea to begin What's Her Name on piano and bring in the strings and just do a piano string arrangement of the first two verses. Uh, do you think I'm crazy? He said, you might be crazy, but you should try it. And, uh, and I brought it in and, and uh, it was one of the things the band talked about in our post and uh, in, in our, our meeting that followed the presentation. And, um, and it's something that I, and then I added a vocal arrangement on top of it. And it's just something that I, I just was so proud of. And then ending the song with cello, which I, I'll never forget the, the cello and the slow descent of the curtain. Uh, so that's something where I went first and it informed what everyone was doing, which was really exciting. Another example is uh, You Ought to Know on, uh, in, in Jagged Little Pill. Sure where um, again, I just felt like um, I wanted the song to begin from a, a, Joe needed to have time to rev up to her anger um, and her energy. Um, and so I wanted to really start smaller. And um, um, it, just, it just felt like the natural place. So it starts with this sort of strings that are, that are, that are uh, these long strings and, and then the piano takes over a little bit and you have this groove, it just keeps 
evolving and keeps building and building and building. And then you have the first chorus that lands on these huge power chords. Um, and, uh, and then I kind of go back and forth between what was on the record and, and some new aspects. Um, and then add the vocal arrangement on top of that. And uh, the first time we did it in, in the theater at ART, they stood up. So it felt like we had managed to take a song that was no small task to live up to the juggernaut and brilliance that it is on the album and carve out a new path for it in the musical. And uh, certainly it's, it's starts with arrangement, but um, Diane and Larby and Brooke, I should say a, a Diablo, um, all, uh, all spoke to, um, to what, what that moment was gonna be. Diablo wrote perfectly up to that moment. Um, uh, that basically just set me in the right place. It was, it was, it was easy to start because of what she had written leading up to that moment. Um, and, uh, and then the actors and of course, Lauren Patton. So, um, these things are, 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 are they're really a team effort and, uh, you have an idea that opens up things a little bit and then you fill them in and then you watch how everyone fills them in and that's the beauty of theater. Well, when I saw the show, and I know it's probably not unique to the performances when it was running, I really honestly didn't know if the show was even going to go on after that point in the show. People were standing up, they were screaming, they were applauding, they were yelling. It was, it's an extraordinary moment of theater, and uh, I can't wait for it to get back on its feet again. I can't either. I'm dreaming yeah. of that moment. It will be, I'm sure at that moment, the theater will erupt for... 20 minutes and that will just be me <laughs> all right I got one one last question this is from kenny and he is asking uh any words of wisdom on managing working several projects at once how do you structure your day and i'm totally curious about this because i honestly don't know how you produce as much as you do um i think that you just have to make sure you carve out the um creative space for each project hopefully they're different so they ask um, different things of you, um, but just use your time wisely. Try to be productive, uh, find the time of day where you are, and, um, and make sure that, that you haven't overburdened yourself, that you're able to shift from this world to this world. I found it easy to go back and forth between the visitor and flying over sunset because they were in such different places. Um, and both rooms would inspire me in a way that I would take that inspiration and, and all that uh, energy to the other project. Um, but I never felt like I was writing the same song. So um, I, think, I think that's gonna help. If, you, if, if, if both projects occupy a different creative space for you, it'll be easier to go back and forth. That's amazing. Well, I can't thank you enough, Tom Kitt. I have virtual applause for you and the time. Thank I'm you. so, so grateful for you. Thank being you. Here. Thank you to everybody who tuned in today. Um, and uh, hopefully it was, it, it was informative and helpful. And uh, um, it's really a pleasure to be with everybody. Thank you. The SDSU Studio Series returns on Friday, May 1st at 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern time with composer and music director, Carmel Dean. The series continues on Mondays and Wednesdays at the same time until May 6. See our website for details, sdsustudioseries.wordpress.com. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Bye. Bye.